Good morning, church. If you would turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Darren for the opportunity to um, to speak this morning. Um, I was quite taken aback by everyone's compliments this morning. I don't know how many people told me that I cleaned up pretty well. <clears throat> and so that got me to thinking what I looked like on a normal <laughs> Sunday morning. So... Um, I was talking to my son-in-law last night. <clears throat> he lives in Springfield, and he's he's been asked for uh, his first time to actually maybe speak in the in the preaching sense in a in a in a small church. And he asked about you know the nerves and that sort of thing. And I said, well, I don't think it ever really gets better in one sense. I think when we're young, we're we're nervous because of well, just being in front of people. You know, we don't like speaking in in front of people, but. I've kind of overcome that, uh, but now it's it's just the gravity of the impact of understanding fully the um, the Word of God and the responsibility that we have to, to the best of our ability, to to preach it and teach it um, correctly. So before we before we go to um, look at the Scripture, we're going to be looking at, at verses one and two this morning. As many of you know, Pastor Darren and others throughout several months now has been preaching from the book of Hebrews. Um, and we know that the writer, writer of Hebrews seems to have two primary audiences um, in, in mind. The, the first one were Christians who needed encouragement, Christians who, who were in the race, but they were suffering. They were being persecuted. They were going through all kinds of trials because of their faith uh, in Christ. The, their, their faith may have been... Um, uh, wavering in the sense they, they were tempted somewhat to, to look back to what they had left. Uh, and these were men and women who needed encouragement to, to stay the course, to finish the race well. And there was a second group, um, a second audience that the writer of Hebrews was, was speaking to, and that, were, uh, that was the group, the spectators who were sitting on the fence. And, and these were men and women who knew the gospel was true. They had heard the gospel. They, they believed the gospel uh, intellectually. They had tasted the, the goodness of God. They had had fellowship with the church. They had hung out with them. But they weren't quite sure that Jesus was worth it. They weren't quite sure that it was worth what they were going to lose, the persecutions, the trials, the sufferings that they'd seen other Christians um, endure, the reputations that were going to be lost in that, in that time and that culture, the, the jobs they would lose, the families who would forsake them. The, they were reluctant to fully commit themselves to this life called, called faith. Uh, and so in the same manner, we come together this morning as, as the audience of, of God, um, an audience that's not unlike our original Hebrew audience. There's, there's probably many in here, probably the majority, I would say, that, that are believing, but there may be some that haven't come to faith in, in Christ yet. Uh, some of you walk in full assurance and some of you don't. Some of you may be walking in deception. Some of you are, are, are eager to please God. Some of you are perhaps very apathetic to the things of God. Some of you are running the race, and some of you are sitting on the sideline as a spectator. And so for this reason, the, the book of Hebrews, specifically the scripture this morning, has something for each of us. Um, James 1.23 describes the word of God like, like a mirror. We, we look in it, and it gives us that reflection back. Um, and the, that mirror is designed to reveal the true condition of, of the heart. So, so let me encourage you this morning. Let God's word do what it's intended to do. Let, let, it, let it cut. Let it divide. Let it encourage. And whatever the mirror may reveal, may you be obedient to whatever that revelation is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So if that in mind, if you'll stand with me. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I do thank you for, um, God, just the privilege to, to speak your word. I thank you for the privilege to, to be among uh, your church this morning. We just simply pray that, that Father, what, whatever you want us to know, whatever you want us to learn, uh, whatever you want us to be deeply implanted in our hearts uh, this morning, that, that uh, your will would be done. And that, Lord, we would uh, be changed for the better. We'd be changed more in the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, teach us how to run this race um, and, and to do it well. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Uh, well, this scripture is full of instruction and, and encouragement, naturally. And so it's tempting to, to go ahead and dive in the passage um, but I don't want to do that just yet because I'm afraid we're going to miss a most crucial question that, that we need to ask. Primarily, the question is, what is the race? If we're going to join the race, we need to know what the race is. And I think if we can define what the race is, then we can better understand and determine uh, probably a more crucial question is, is are we in the race? Are, are we in this race that's set before us? Verse 1 says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the writer of Hebrews is, uh, he's using a metaphor to compare the Christian life with a race. And it's a metaphor that the early church would have clearly understood. Uh, they were very familiar with the foot races that took places in the stadiums and the aud auditoriums of, of Rome. And they understood that these races required discipline, they required uh, training, they required focus, and they even required uh, suffering. Uh, these races were were excruciating, long-distance events that even involved agony. And, and that's important to note because the original word used for race here, when it says, let us run the race, that original word is agonai, or we might say agony. Uh, let us run with patience the race or the agony that is set before us. Can you imagine if Pastor Darren put that on the, the church sign, come and join our, our agony? It's not a very good church, church but there's, there's meaning in that word. There's, there's, there's meaning of the cost of what it means to follow Christ in, in that word. And these, these early Christians would have, would have understood that. Um, they, they knew what was required. They knew the hardships. But the agony was worth it because of the prize that it waited at the finish line. Throughout the scriptures, we're consi consistently confronted with the realities of following Christ. It's, it's through many scriptures. And at our finish line, there's something that's incomparable to anything that these runners were looking at. They were looking at a medal or, or a gold piece. At our finish line, we find nothing less than Jesus Christ and his eternal glory. That's what waits at our finish line. And if you remember, the Apostle Paul also used metaphors for the Christian life. He, he spoke about a boxer. He spoke about um, a, a, a soldier in the battle. Soldiers go to war, boxers get in the ring, and runners run the race. And it's all with the intention of finishing well. It's all with the intention of winning. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And you'll see this in your bulletin. Here's, if I could summarize really what the race is. It really is the Christian life. The race is everything that happens to you. The, the good, the bad, that comes under the sovereignty of God and passes through the providence of God so that you may endure to the finish line, so you may endure to the end by faith. That's the race that we run. In other words, this race is everything that God allows in your life. He calls you in the race. He's the one that sets the course. And it's all with an intended, uh, very intentional and with purpose of what's going to get you to the end and get you there still living in faith. I'm afraid Pastor Darren was speaking about the importance of sharing the gospel. And I, I think sometimes in our desire for others to know Christ, which which is a, a great desire. I'm afraid we oftentimes fail to really explain the race, really ex explain the, the whole counsel of God and what it means to, to follow Christ. Because it seems like at the first sign of spiritual interest, 
we're, we're all too eager to seize the moment, have a person to pray a, a quick prayer, or raise a hand if they want to uh, escape hell. If I was to ask everyone in here this morning, who, who wants to escape hell? Who does not want to go there? I would presume every hand would go up. Absolutely. However, that is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. Offering price without the gospel has filled the American church with millions of unconverted churchgoers. These are people who have joined the church, but they haven't joined the race. These are people who find convenience. Now, get this. They find convenience in God's goodness, but not in his will. These are people who may have come to Jesus with a raised hand or a prayer, but they haven't come with repentance and faith. The very thing that is the entry into the race. On the other hand, Jesus had a far different approach to his gospel conversations. In fact, it seems that he went out of his way to discourage people, which seems kind of odd. But listen, to, to listen to what it says in Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot, cannot be my disciple. So, so listen to what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you don't come to him with childlike faith, trusting everything into his care, you cannot follow him. Not just you cannot, it's impossible to follow him without faith. When someone comes to Christ and asks to follow him or, or um, uh, question, the, it wasn't a high five and a quick prayer. It just wasn't. It was more of a heart examination. Are you sure? Do you understand what you're getting into? Do you understand the implication? Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That's what you're asking for. That's what you're wanting to join. That's the race that you're wanting to run with me. So that's the race to find. The next question is, how do we run this race? If you've joined the race, you know you've come to him in repentance and faith. Uh, I think the scripture looks at three primary principles or lessons uh, that I believe are found in verses 1 and 2. First of all, we're to run the race with faith. And so we're going to probably spend most of our time on that point because that's really what Hebrews is all about. Number two, that we're to run with freedom. And number three, we're to run this race with focus. Verse 1 says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, as we know, verse 1 is speaking of this, this great cloud of witnesses, all these men and women who were just mentioned in uh, chapter 11, who run the race well, who, who endured to the end, and they were all commended by God for their faith. Hebrews eleven thirteen 13 says this about them. It says, all died in faith not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And so our scripture this morning is, is arguing for a logical response with that word, therefore. Therefore, since, since we have these witnesses, since they finished the race well, let us run like them. Now, when we speak of this, this cloud of witnesses, I don't necessarily, and there's different views on this, but I don't believe the scripture is necessarily saying that, that these men and women had the capacity or the ability to, to look down in the present moment and to witness us in our daily, in our daily lives. I don't believe that's, that's what it's saying. I believe what the scripture is teaching here is that these men and women are testifying to their lives, to the, to the past. They're, they're, we're surrounded by a great number of testimonies. Um, the lives of men and women who are testifying to the value of living a life of faith. They're testifying to the value of God's faithfulness, his mercy, and, and his grace. These, from the pages of Scripture, these are, these are witnesses who have a testimony to share, a testimony of not only what faith is, what faith looks practically in the life of those who trust God. So Hebrews 11 tells us what faith is. It's the assurance of things hoped for and a conviction of things not yet seen. Assurance and conviction. But this great cloud of witnesses teaches us what faith does. 
And in your bulletin, this is, um, this is in your bulletin. We may know what faith is, but do we, but do we do what faith does? And that often seems like a contradictory statement because, because of a works-related righteousness or a works-related salvation. It's, it's very easy to, to fall into that. But the fact is that faith does. And, and if you say, well, what does faith does? First of all, faith believes. Faith believes. It believes the words of God and his promises. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is the word of God when believed that gives us the substance of Hebrews 11, 1. When the word of God is believed, it gives us that assurance of things hope uh, of hope for and and the sub, and the conviction of things not seen, and secondly, and this is a offspring of the first one. First of all, faith believes. Secondly, faith obeys. And here's why faith obeys. Faith obeys because we have the assurance and the conviction that comes from the Word of God. Look at the testimony of Abraham, who by faith obeyed God. It says that he left his land, left his home, took his family, lived in tents as foreigners in a foreign land. Um, and why did he do that? Because he had assurance and conviction in the promise of another city that was had foundation whose architect and builder was God. His belief led to the doing. Look at the testimony of Moses, a man of faith who left Egypt not fearing the wrath of king, the king, because, and get this, because the scripture says he's seen him who is unseen. That's, that's crucial. He's seen him who is unseen. That's why he did it. And it led him down a road of obedience. It led him down a road of suffering and, and, um, and persecution. And it says that he chose to stand with the people of God rather than enjoy the sins and pleasures of Egypt, even for a season. And why did he do that? Because he was filled with assurance and conviction after seeing him who was unseen. Church, we need, we need to get this. Every time we open up the word of God, we are seeing him who is unseen. Every time that we sit under preaching or teaching of God's word, we are seeing him who is unseen. So here's the problem. Hearing the word of God doesn't guarantee we will see him who is unseen. Now, you might presume it does, because didn't Romans 10, 17 just say, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God? Well, let me give a word of caution here. Romans 10, 17 is not a promise that everyone who hears the word of God will have faith. Romans 10, 17 is a statement of fact of how it does come to those who believe. It comes through the word of God. There's multitudes. The Bible even says the majority of people are on a, a broad road. A majority of people today and a majority of people throughout history who have heard the word of God and still don't believe. Why is that? That's a good question. Why is it that you can speak the word of God to somebody and they don't believe? They, they don't commit themselves to Christ. They don't join the race. If you would, flip back to Hebrews chapter 4. I believe this is going to explain why people are not obedient to the word of God. And this isn't discounting the, the work of the Holy Spirit, but I believe that this scripture gives us reason why the word of God will draw some people to him and it will repel others from him. Chapter 4, verses uh, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they did also. But the word they heard did not profit them. Did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. This is speaking about the people in the wilderness. That they heard the word of God preached, but it wasn't united with belief. It wasn't united with assurance and conviction. And this is, this is a tragic thing. I mean, imagine this. This is a people who heard about the, the promise 
of a land flowing with milk and honey. Yet everything they heard, it says it profited them nothing. Because what they heard, what was preached to them, was not embraced or mixed or united with faith. They could tell you what faith is. They heard it preached for 40 years. They could tell you what faith does. They've seen it firsthand in Moses and Joshua and Caleb. But even in all this, they refuse to do what faith does. So the question is, is do you do what faith does? You may know what it is. You, you may know what it does, but do you do what faith does? If you're in this race, you, you have to do what faith does. Do you believe the word of God? And more importantly, do you obey the word of God? If not, then the word of God is profiting you nothing. Even if you've heard it for 40 years. People can sit in church 30, 40 years. Just like the people in the wilderness have the word of God preached to them. Be part of the church. Be, be on the church roll. And this says it profits them nothing. And they'll never enter in the promise, the promise that still remains. Church, we need to seek by God's grace to live out the exhortation we find in James 1.32. Humbly accepting the word of God planted within us to the saving of our souls, not being deceived by merely hearing the word of God, but being doers of the word of God. That is what it means to run by faith. Secondly, not only are we to run by faith, we're also to run with freedom. Verse 1 says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So, so there's two areas that become problematic in our, in our Christian life, for you and for me and for all of us, um, or for a runner in general, the things that in, hinder or encumber um, and the sin that so easily entangles, or to say another way, the sin that's so easily um, to commit. The runners to lay these things down, it's, it literally means to throw them to, to the side in order to run with freedom. And the idea is that once this is done, only then can you run with endurance and with patience, the race that is set before us. Now, now sin speaks for itself, and in my attempt to shorten this message last night, I had to cut out everything I wanted to say about sin. <coughs> but I will say this about willful, unrepentant sin. Now, I can just take a multitude of scriptures and summarize it in a short statement. Just stop it. Just stop it. If you're a gossip, if you're an adulterer, if you're a fornicator, if you're viewing pornography, if you're holding on to unforgiveness or hatred or backbiting, just stop it. Seek God's grace and repent. You, I'm afraid there's times where we've, we've fallen into this idea that we have to, to embrace psychology. What psychology does is just affirm that we have a sinful nature. And, and in its proper respect, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with understanding how the mind works and all that. But it's not the solution. The solution is God's grace. It's going to God's grace. If, if you're having trouble repenting, go to God for grace. If you're having trouble believing, go to God for grace. And while the sin is the most, probably the most prominent and deadly thing that, that we're going to deal with, the, the Scripture also mentions another area that needs our attention and these are things that hinder us, things that encumber us. And this is a different category from, from sin. These, these are things that can even be, uh, at first sight, good things. Uh, nothing sinful or bad within, in within themselves. But they're things that slow us down. There's, there's things that, that weigh us down. And that word there, hindrances or encumbrances, whatever your scripture may say, literally means unnecessary weight or unnecessary bulk that we carry in this race that, that is hindering us. It's slowing us down. It's, it's weighing us down. Throwing off this unnecessary bulk reminds me uh, of throwing off good things. It reminds me of the, the, the scripture and, and the story in Acts 27 um, where Paul is being held as a prisoner on a Roman ship. And as they're sailing to Rome... They encounter a storm. And a lot of you know the, the account. 
He tells them what they need to do. They don't believe. The, the ship starts to break up. They put ropes under and try to tie it together. But there comes a point when the storm is so bad and things are so desperate that the crew begins to throw the cargo overboard. They begin to throw, the next day they throw the fish tackle overboard. Now here's what's interesting. These are, these are things that, not knowing God's providence, that they were going to survive that. They were throwing things that just a few days before, on sunny calm days, things that were good. But in the middle of a storm, in the middle of, of this trial and tribulation and, and, um, and everything that was going on, suddenly this cargo became a deadly weight. It became unnecessary bulk that had to go if they were to survive. And so I think the principle here is, is and, I'm, and I'm hesitant, I think we could name a hundred different hindrances, things that are good but that, that are hindered, things that may not be sin, but they slow us and weigh us down. But I'm afraid if, if we were to go for a list, it, there's no way that it would, it would catch, because it's different for each of us. And only God, and typically if we already know what hinders us, what saps our time and our attention and the things from God, and again, that, that may not be into the realm of sin yet, but we know. God has already shown us. We know what hinders that relationship with, with the Lord. And so sometimes good things have to be sacrificed for the better things. And I, and I think that's the point that we're making here. I think of Pastor Darren when he was running in the, the Boston Marathon. Uh, he wasn't weighed down with a heavy backpack. He wasn't weighed down with, um, with things such as trying to talk on the phone while he ran or checking his Facebook status. Things that, that were good in themselves, but it had to be laid aside, put aside for the sake of the race. Um, Hindrances can be anything that, that can cause spiritual growth, uh, uh, to stagnate or to decline. Uh, typically, here, here's the way I, I think w- typically hindrances are worldly pursuits that are given excessive attention that pay no spiritual dividends. That's kind of how I would define that. Again, things you can do, think, but they're not going to pay any spiritual dividends and actually can hinder, can prevent from what, God's best is for, for this race. Um, Matthew 6.33 says this, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will provide everything you need. Now imagine if we really believe that. If we had the assurance and the conviction that God really would provide everything we need. Faith in God is designed by its very nature, by its very substance, to free our hearts from this world, uh, to free our hearts from the worldly pursuits in order that we can pursue, in order that we can seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's running with freedom. So we run with faith, we run with freedom, and the principle of lesson number three is that we run with focus. Verse two says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. It, it's, it's like a laser focus to, to, to focus on the things of God and the things of the kingdom and, and, and Jesus him, himself. It also carries the idea of looking away from other things. You can't be looking at other things, even other runners, trials and tribulations in your life. Now, we don't ignore them, but our focus, even in that, is to be focused on Jesus. And, and remember that the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of professing Jewish Christians who are being re- tempted to return back to, to Judaism. Um, he's encouraging them to look to Jesus because Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the law. Jesus is better than the animal sacrifices. Jesus is better than anything that this world has to offer. And you have to keep your focus on Christ to to walk in that realization every day. That's that's why we're to to look to Jesus. The, the, The scripture here reminds me of a famous quote by Corrie ten Boom. Some of you know she was a Dutch Christian Holocaust and concentration camp survivor who went through horrific trials and tribulations. She said this, she said, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. 
If you look within, you'll be depressed. But if you look to God, you will find rest. And that's what this scripture is, is teaching. Corey Ten Boom, with all that she went through in life, she learned to keep her focus on Christ. And, and I think here's the lesson. When, when a runner loses focus, when a runner can no longer see the finish line, um, then he can no longer see the worth of the race. He, and, when, and when that happens, their focus is going to be shift to what is the personal cost of the race. In other words, we run because of the finish line. We run because Christ is, is there in his eternal glory. But when our focus is off of him and we begin to look at the circumstances around us, the worth isn't on Jesus and what awaits us. The worth is back on the cost that it's costing us personally. And again, this was, this was the, something that was worth, worth it in the beginning suddenly has become too costly. And that's the same uh, primary issue that the writer of Hebrew was addressing with these Jewish professing Christians. Is, is following Jesus worth the cost? That's, that's, a, that's a question that Jesus himself says that, that we should ask and, and that we should uh, evaluate. Now, it's easy to answer this question when following Christ isn't costing us anything. Um, but what do we say when faith begins to cost us? When faith begins to cost us more than an hour or two on Sunday mornings or an hour or two through the, through the week? What happens when we ever find ourselves, in, and we will someday, I don't know what generation, but it, but it will come. It's the normal Christian life. It's what the early Jewish church had. It's what they've had through history, and there's what many is even happening, even in our world today. What happens when they start taking our lands and, and our homes? They, they throw Christians, they throw us into prison, the labor camps. They kill us, and they, they, they torture our family. That's the reality of this original audience that the writer of Hebrews is speaking with. That's the ones who were trying to figure out if it's really worth following Christ. And it's a reality for many Christians today. If our focus is on Christ, then we will stand and endure to the end and say, absolutely, Jesus is worth it. Absolutely. Jesus is worth it because of all that he is. And I think this last part of verse 2 just quickly, we'll, we'll go through it. It says he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the perfect example of faith. We can look back to the, the men and women in, in chapter 11, but these were men and women like you and I, born with a sinful nature that sinned, but yet you had the perfecter. You had Jesus who had never sinned, who, who, who didn't deserve or have any of this coming to him. But he, he started the, the race, he finished it. He finished it well. He done the will of God. He declared it is finished. Not only is Jesus the, the object of our faith in that sense, he's the very substance of our faith. I think Ben spoke about that this morning. He says not only is the light, he is the substance of that light. He, he is the bread of life. He is the living water. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of, of my faith and, and your faith. That's the reason we look to him. He is the source. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I think we understand it's easy to look back and see when we were saved and the, the value of the gospel when we first became Christians. We were saved by grace through faith. But here's the thing, not only were you saved by grace, you are being saved by grace, and you will be saved by grace. You were born again, you're being sanctified, and you will be glorified. It is a, it is a one-time event, but yet it is a continual event. <clears throat> when you first were saved, understand that it was by God's grace, but it was through faith. Faith is what allowed God's grace to become operative in our life, in our salvation. It's what made it a reality. So when you look at it and understand it from that point, if he saved us and he's, if we're being saved, faith to faith, glory to glory, we went to Jesus in the beginning. By faith, we beheld his grace. 
That's why our focus is to be on Jesus today. We are being saved and we continually, we abide in that grace. We, he's the one that gives us the strength and the grace to, to finish uh, this and endure to the end. That we're being sanctified, running the race, persevering to the end. And it's the same way we were saved, by grace through faith. And that's what's killing the Apostle Paul when he was speaking to the, the Christians in, in Galatians. Galatians 1.6, here's what he says. He says, I am amazed that you are deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel. Paul was amazed that they had started by focusing on Christ, but now they were focusing on everything else. They said they knew that grace saved them at the beginning, but now they're, he says, you've turned to a different gospel. They've taken their focus off Christ, off Jesus. Him who is unseen. They took their eyes off him who is unseen. The one who endured the cross on our behalf. The one who despised the shame on, on our behalf. And the one who is now sitting in authority at the right hand of God, still intercessing for you and me. That's the reason we keep our focus on Christ. And if you're here this morning and you're sitting on the fence, wondering if all this is true, wondering if Jesus is worth this race called the Christian life. Let me just say this as simply as I know how. There will be no regrets at the finish line. No regrets at the finish line. Get in the race while the invitation is open. The Lord says today is the day of salvation. Today the invitation is to join this race. Get in the race before it's eternally too late. That's the invitation that the Lord gives and if you're already in the race, run it with assurance. Run it with conviction. Throw off the things that are hindering you, um, slowing you down. And then finally, fix your eyes on Christ. Keep, keep your eyes fixed on Christ. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on the completion to the day of Christ. I just want to close with a scripture, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but, he ha but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And here's, listen to this, church, verse 16. This is how we endure. Verse 16, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. That's with assurance. That's with conviction of his promises. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. Um, thank you for your mercy, your grace. Thank you, Lord, that, that you are the, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, this race can be full of trials and tribulations but and suffering. Um, but, Lord, again, everything that comes into our life passes through your providence and your sovereignty. And we know that, that you love us. We know that everything is works together for good um, to those who love you. And so, Lord, may we just, uh, we just rest in that. And, Lord, when we find the race is, is getting hard, when we find the race... It's too much. I just pray, Lord, that we would come to you with, with confidence, the, the throne of your grace, and find help in our time of need, find help um, to patiently endure. And, Lord, may we look with great joy to the finish line where men and women of old, Hebrews 11, were standing there as eternal testimonies of your goodness, your faithfulness, and your salvation. And, Lord, we trust and we pray that, that, God, your grace will take us there. Help us to believe. Help us to obey. In Jesus' name, amen.
and the free.